I'm going to be here presenting for you. Um, this is a work jointly with my team at Infineon. Um, the main author, Sangamita Shakaponti, she was not able to get the trip to Dallas. Um, she didn't have time, so I had the pleasure of being here. Um, yeah, the topic is explainable AI for gas sensors. Um, me and my colleagues, we're an algorithm team, so I'm not a technology person, a hardware guy. Um, you, however, can ask me some questions, and I will actually start with that. So how is our sensor actually working? Um, so basically, we have a graphene-based sensor with four sensing fields. These four sensing fields have been materialized differently. So with a functionalization, they each um, show a little bit of a different resistance to when operating with the gas. And, and we measure the resistance. So it's a chemioresistive system, measure four resistances. And in addition to just having the chemiosorption, we, we try to basically induce um, the desorption a bit by having a temperature modulation. So we periodically heat the sensor. Basically, with the heated sensor, it induces inside um, desorption. So it's sort of a cleaning step for the sensor. Afterwards, we again put it to a lower temperature. Sensor is absorbing, and, and we periodically do this, basically. And so what we see is that there is a number of effects happening. So after the resistance here at the bottom, so obviously a heated sensor heating increases conductivity. So this is basically inverse. The resistance follows inversely to the temperature modulation, but also um, adsorbing gas increases, increases conductivity. So that's the two main effects showing here. And then I uh, have here um, red, the red curve basically is just the inverse of the temperature. So if there's no gas interaction, the resistance is just manipulated by the temperature. But as soon as the sensor interacts with the gas, basically you see the green curve. So that's where the, the more complex sensor response comes in. And what we did now is, so I, I started off with the rectangular temperature modulation shape because it's really easy to understand, right? Hot, hot temperature, low temperature. But what we're actually doing is we heat it in a sinusoidal motion. And what that allows us to do is extract much more like delicate and meaning, I personally think meaningful and hopefully with the methods of I am showing later, I can kind of basically show why they're meaningful. The much more meaningful features by, by being more easily able to perform an FFT on the signal and get some, some frequency domain features out there as well. And how is our whole processing chain now looking? We have the sensor where we measure the resistance. We have the heating signal. So that is sinusoidal, we extract some time periods, we process these individually, we normalize with the baseline resistance, right? So not, not a absolute resistance, but a relative resistance change. So we have a sensitivity here and we extract. So here it is, it is displayed, which is also the five main features from this um, presentation. It's the slope is basically a rate of change. So derivative approximation sensitivity, which is the relative resistance. And then three features that we extract in the frequency domain via an FFT, which is the amplitude of the fundamental frequency, the phase shift of the fundamental frequency, and a total harmonic distortion. We have then five features times four sensing fields, which makes 20 features. Put those in a recurrent neural network, namely a GRU um, for like the, the less space requirements of the GRU being more efficient on a microcontroller hardware. We have a train beforehand, so we look at the train parameters, feed it the 20 feature parameters, and then the neural network basically puts out the gas predictions or what a user of a gas sensor is actually interested in. So um, now, having seen the processing chain, why actually using explainable AI for this? And AI is basically used in so many, so many areas these days, automotive, finance, healthcare, sensors. We, yeah, that is where we are all here. And some of those are actually really like critical domains, right? So you don't want to make an error there. And we actually want to know why a model is failing, right? And that's basically a problem because the more complex your machine learning models get, the more of a black box they are. And actually, even as a designer, you are not always able to actually justify a decision made by your model. And so that's where explainable AI and interpretable AI comes in. Explainable AI is basically a set of tools and methods where 
it allows you to look a little bit behind the curtain and maybe justify some decisions and give you more of an understanding of it. And so that's what we are using. And here in this case, and for us, it's not only about justifying the model, because that's one point. I'm an algorithm guy. For me, that's important. That's part of my job. But also, we're working with gas sensors, and they are not perfect, right? So maybe we can also infer some things out of this usage of explainable AI and feed it back to the technology development of the gas sensor. So that's actually the more interesting part of this analysis. Just to clear some taxonomies, so within this framework of explainable and interpretable AI. There are intrinsic methods. So intrinsic methods is usually named as interpretable AI, but it's models that are inherently interpretable. And often though, this comes with the cost of having really limited complexity in the model. So if you think of, for example, linear regression, it's actually quite easy to understand what the really linear regression model does, but also capabilities are really limited. And the other end of this is now a postdoc model methods. That's more the explainable AI part where we're trying to afterwards get the information out of the model decisions. So after the model is trained, use it upon the model. And on the other side, there's this classification where you can say model specific or model agnostic. And these are really model specific are cases, for example, if you have a classification tree, it's really specific to the model that you can interpret certain things of it, but the methods are not usable then for a neural network on the other. And model agnostic then is the other end where basically it doesn't matter which kind of model you use, but again, it's, it's just, uh, yeah, you put it afterwards, so for most and mostly post-talk methods again, afterwards on the trained model, you use them, these methods. And that's actually the first method we have a focus here, which is feature importance. I showed you how we basically get our features and what are we getting. And, and now we want to rank them with a method called SHAP. There are other feature ranking methods, but basically that's the one we are using. And SHAP is coming from um, basically Shapley values. So that's the main concept behind it, which is originated from game theory. And there, the idea was actually to, uh, to basically infer uh, what's the individual contribution of a player in the game. So if you think about it, like, bear, bear with me. Um, I, I have an example from soccer, right? So if a game ends one to zero, you would say, well, the, the striker who scored the goal probably has large impact, but maybe also the defense has a large impact on the, on the win, right? So it's more a way of contributing or, or rather quantifying the contribution of an individual that is maybe not so obvious. And when we perform the SHEP analysis here, on our neural network model on our GRU and with the different feature sets and basically I'll have a look at the next slide, how this then unfolds. But for us, it was really interesting because we were able to actually infer a lot of interesting things that are usable beyond just um, from a model standpoint, because we also saw that um, initially on when we first did this analysis, all the features corresponding to the sentence of R3 were having really, really low scores. And that's where we were able to provide feedback back to our technology people and say, well, it's always R3 that's for us low with us on actually having an impact in our model prediction. And they were then able to put a focus there rather than into the blue, trying to improve material everywhere. They said, okay, let's, let's have a specific look on R3. And now it's actually the best performing sensing field in terms of feature contribution. Another thing is I showed you the seating modulation where we, went, we switched from the rectangular hot and cold sides to a smooth sinusoidal motion. And with that, we're able to calculate some new features. And it was also, and we were also able to look, hey, have these new features that we think are nice actually have an impact on our prediction, or is it just the same old features that we used before? So just to name a few impacts where this feature analysis has an impact beyond just having a a little bit of an insight to the model decision, but also where it was able to have an impact on technology and system development. And also features that we didn't use, we could just drop because a smaller neural network is easier to train, more efficient to run on a microcontroller. So this also has a lot of impact. Like, so you want to have features to have an impact. So now what we're seeing here, it's, it's quite a lot there. On the left-hand side, um, we see at the, but it's, that's the features and at the top left, 
we see some gas profile that we run. So it's a mixture of ozone and NO2 that we run with our machine gas sensor. So we have some, we start off with a high, so, so basically ozone going up then both gases going up more or less simultaneously then only NO2 going up and then both gases again going up simultaneously. And the corresponding features, which is the relative resistance, the sensitivity basically, a derivative. And on the right hand side, we have those frequency domain extractive features, which, which is basically the amplitude of the fundamental frequency, the total harmonic distortion, and phase angle. Now, in each, or each of those, we have four times for the four sensing. And now, how do they rank? We actually have a really nice, as I said earlier, distribution of R3. So the first, in the first half, we have almost all our three features, and we also have a really high contribution of the phase angle, then some relative resistances, the distortion, the total harmonic distortion of R1 or zero. It's actually not that important, but basically what we see is that the features that are really nicely correlated with the gas concentration of a zone, if you see, look at, at it's the total harmonic distortion, the phase angle, obviously have also quite a large contribution to the model prediction. But also, we still need the relative resistance, which is sort of our go to basic feature. And then they basically distribute it. And the derivatives actually have a little bit less of an impact. This, however, can change. So, this is one specific case. If we have a profile that's really fastly changing, the rate of change, the derivative becomes more impactful. So, this is really now a feature ranking result for this specific case. If I use another profile of gas concentration, another phase of usage from a sensor. This uh, feature distribution might change and I get a new insight out of it. Um, so that was basically the shared part. I, we also, because it's explainable AI for gas sensors, we also want to show here another method that we use to get more insight into our model predictions, and which is network dissection. So I said earlier, we have this GRU networks and basically we have a rather simple version of this where we have just one hidden layer of GRUs with a couple of units and a uh, uh, fully connected um, layer basically at the end that does the regression of the gases. And we can now, which is a technique that's actually more commonly used in computer vision, have a look at the activation maps of, of your picture. And here we don't have a picture, we have a time series. So we structured it a little bit different to where we basically have an out, our output shown of the, the gas concentration profiles so of each dot. Is basically one point of gas concentrations we have and, and the mixtures of it. And the orange dots are positive activation, so positive sign uh, activations so above zero, and the activations after the activation function of the GRU units that are blue dots basically are negative activation. And we looked at the individual units, and it was actually quite insightful because there are, for example, some units that specifically target if one gas is low or one is gas is high. So we have now the unit uh, three, which specifically activates when there is no ozone. Then we have the unit one, which specifically activates when there's no NO2. But we also have the units where they really expect the mixture to happen. And one which is really interesting for us was the unit six, because there's an underlying physical effect that we are hardly can overcome, is that if NO2 and ozone happen simultaneously, Ozone is sort of masking NO2. And this is also, there's some chemical literature on us. It's not really a model problem, but rather a physical chemical one to overcome. And sort of, we see here with unit six that it only can sort of activate when NO2 is really larger than ozone. So that's where we saw some impact happening. And basically, you know, to conclude all this analysis, we saw that with the SHAP analysis, we were able to rank the feature and even above ranking those features and having some insight how they play into our model decisions, we were able to identify situations where we might improve our hardware because we could sort of re-link the features to the hardware behind it, to the physics behind it, and also to the system level where we saw the different heat remodulation has an impact and how it plays into the, to the feature ranking when we extract different features with it. The other part was that we, yeah, basically could drop features. Initially, I, I forgot to mention this, but when we had the chap ranking, I basically showed you the final one. We had in an earlier version, we extracted much more harmonics with our FFT, so second or third order, seventh order. 
and we basically saw that the higher order harmonics don't play to the prediction. So what we did, we just dropped them, had a leaner model that's easier to run on the microcontroller, is, is much more efficient, basically easier to train, smaller models are easier to train. So we we're able to do that. And with the network dissection, we are able to do similar things because we also saw which, like if we have an abundance of units, we could maybe drop some units, or if we have too few units, we have not diverse enough of activations, we could add a unit. So the much more efficient process of hyperparameter tuning than just trying 10,000 things. And also we have an insight on some properties of basically prediction making that we're maybe not able to overcome because there's some physical nature of it. And it's also reflect in this network dissection analysis. Yeah, basically I'm done and I'm open for questions.